Hello, everyone. Thank you for being so patient. Can you hear me? There's a few more people coming. To, not too well? Okay, let me get a little closer. Um, thanks for coming out on a rainy afternoon for Kate's story and her book, White House by the Sea, A Century of the Kennedys at Hyannisport. Kate drove all the way from New Jersey in the pouring rain to do this, so she is a trooper. Um, please, before we start, please silence your phones. And I'd like to thank the Friends of the Library who make these programs possible, as well as Barrett's Bookstore, who has a book for sale. And now let me tell you a little bit about Kate, and Kate will take questions at the end of the program. Okay. Um, Kate's story is the senior features editor at Rolling Stone. She was previous, previously a staff writer at Esquire, where she covered culture and politics, and has written long-form profiles and narratives featured for Vanity Fair, Mary Claire, Town and Country, and other publications. As I said, she lives in New Jersey with her family, who have trooped down with her also, and we are so happy she's joining us this afternoon. Get back in the Thank you so much for having me and for everyone who made it here in this off and on rain, which we drove a little bit through. Um, it's been an amazing summer to talk to audiences about this book, which I started back in the fall of 2019. I was working at Esquire Magazine, as I said in my introduction, and I had just written an article about JFK Jr.'s George Magazine. I don't know how many of you remember that magazine from the 90s about um, pop culture and politics, which are the beats I cover. Um, so I'd written an article about that magazine and had, had had a conversation with a book agent about possibly tackling a book about hyena support. Um, so that's how it all began. Uh, here's a glimpse of my last few years. I spent two summers in hyena support with my husband and my son who are here today. Um, I did the interviews in the summers of 2020 and 2021, hence the face masks in every photo. Luckily, I did my research during the summer as appropriate for Cape Cod, so I was able to interview people, you know, six feet apart, masks on, on porches, on park benches, um, on boats. So this is a little bit of kind of a glimpse of the reporting process. This is me with my son uh, on the boat tour. If you've been to Hyannis, there are these boat tours that take you alongside the Kennedy compound houses. That's us going on one of these tours. Um, on the right, that's me with Max Kennedy going sailing. I reached out to Max Kennedy a few times. I never heard back. I finally heard back from him in the fall of 2020, and he said, I'll talk to you, but it has to be on my sailboat because you can't understand the Kennedys unless you understand sailing. Um, so that's me on, this, on the sailboat, which was an amazing experience, a very, very difficult way to interview somebody, um, but we made do. Uh, so the book covers 100 years. So the Kennedy's history in Hyannis Sports starts in the 1920s, um, and the book goes all the way up until today. So I was covering 100 years of history. So in addition to the interviews I did, I talked to about a dozen members of the Kennedy family and about 100 of their friends, neighbors, staff. I had to also dig through a lot of local archives, um, old lo went through old local newspaper and magazine uh, articles, property records, letters, oral, old oral histories to tell the stories, particularly of, these, of the older years. So this is me in one of the local libraries on Cape Cod, the Sturgis Library, if anybody's familiar with it. It's just this beautiful old library there where, where I did a lot of my research. And that's, that's my son who was by my side <laughs> the, the whole time. So as I said, the story starts in the 1920s. Uh, Joe and Rose Kennedy, the patriarch and matriarch of the family, both grew up, grew up with their families going to the beach in Maine. So it was a way for their families to kind of escape the stifling heat of Boston. Um, and when they got married, they started looking for their own place to spend their summers with their growing family. They started in Cohasset, uh, outside of Boston, but Joe wasn't accepted to the golf club there on account of being Irish Catholic. Um, it was so, they kind of experimented with different communities uh, dri within driving distance of Boston. Rose Kennedy went on a shopping trip for her birthday, and that's how they kind of stumbled across Hyannis, and that's how they ended up in the neighborhood of Hyannis Port. So this is one of the summers. They rented this house called Malcolm Cottage. This is the, these are the kids in the water. Uh, that's Rosemary Kennedy, JFK, uh, Eunice Kennedy at the time, JF, uh, jo Joe Jr., and Kick Kennedy. So they ended up buying the house that they had rented for the couple of summers, and they did a massive renovation, doubling it in size. So this is in the backyard of the house. That's Joe Jr. and JFK. Um, you can, the, the Nantucket Sound is kind of right to the right of them. The house is, is behind them. 
So the Kennedys, there was kind of a mixed reaction when they moved into town. Joe Kennedy was a very big personality and people kind of didn't quite know what to make of him. Uh, Rose Kennedy very much kept to herself, but the kids made very fast friends with their neighbors. Um, these are some of, the, some of the neighbors who were, they were very close to in the, in the community. Also as part of the renovation of the house, they built um, a movie theater. Joe Kennedy at the time was, was working in movies. It was very important to, to him to have kind of the state of the art a movie projector in his basement and about 50 people fit in the basement and they would have movie nights and they would invite all the kids from the neighborhood, uh, the families of the staff and um, they would all kind of cram into this movie theater to watch movies. So this is one of the movie nights. Um, as I've, as I've kind of, the way I thought about this book is it's certainly a book about the Kennedy family but more than anything it's a book about a community, it's a book about how they fit into this community and so I thought a lot about and I wrote a lot about in the book about the neighbors who had a really big impact on them who have perhaps not been included in other books about, about the family. Um, so it was, to me, it was, this is really a book about a community more than anything else. So Nancy Tenney is a longtime neighbor of the family, is this woman in the beautiful dress. And I, um, I kind of was able to really think about the family through her eyes uh, as I did my reporting, I did my research, thinking about her experience with this family that was kind of growing and growing in stature and importance as the decades went on and what it was like for her as a neighbor to see the change in this, the, their, her best friends in this family um, was one way I was really able to kind of do my reporting and research in a way that I was able to relate, uh, relate to it. Uh, this is Joe Kennedy again. Um, after his son uh, Joe Jr. died in the war, he, used, he um, donated money to the town and they, had, they made an ice skating rink in Joe Jr.'s name. So this is him uh, doing the dedication there. Uh, this is Rose Kennedy. I get asked a lot um, who, who I'm most like learning about or who most surprised me, and Rose Kennedy is certainly up there. Um, she's JFK Jr.'s mother, and she's, been, she's of course always in the, the history books. She's always there. She's always kind of presented as kind of stoic and strong and kind of um, you know, an important part of the family, but also kind of a little cold, a little removed. And I found thinking about her as a mother, as a neighbor, I was really able to kind of see a different side of her. She really opened up when she was in Hyannisport. Some of the stories her neighbors told about her were incredible. Like she, she was really able to let her guard down when she was there in a, in a way that I think that she's really not portrayed in many other um, portrayals of the family. As I said, it's really a book about a community and I, that some of the neighbors in this, in this community um, I was, I was very fascinated by. This is Eugenia Forts. When I first went to um, Hyannis Port, I noticed that there's the one public beach in town is named not, not for the Kennedys, which is the family so closely associated with the place. It's named for Eugenia Forts. She was uh, one of the founding members of the um, Cape Cod chapter of the NAACP, and she was the neighbor of the family um, and worked for many of the family's neighbors as well and had a huge impact um, kind of throughout the family's history there. Um, and learning about her, I found, I found really interesting as well. So this is um, Jackie's first trip to the compound. Um, the way it's described, it was described to me from neighbors and kind of through the local news archives, is this is when everything changed was this visit. Um, the family was well known, you know, Joe Kennedy worked in movies, he was an ambassador, there was certainly a lot of attention on the family through the years. But this weekend was after JFK Jr. was, um, or excuse me, JFK was, it was announced that they were engaged and he brought her back to the house and the phone was just ringing off the hook. People were so excited to see who this kind of, this young bachelor senator was, was engaged to. And he brought her back and the, the street, the edge of the street was just lined with newspaper reporters and photographers. And these photos appeared in the Boston Globe as well as other local newspapers. And this is really when this family and this community shift into really a, a, a very public kind of um, fishbowl type of, type of place. This is during the campaign. This is inside the big house. The big house is the, the first house I mentioned um, that Joe and Rose Kennedy bought. Um, this is in the corner of it. You can see the, it's right on the water. You can see back to the window. By this time though, JFK and Jackie had bought their own house um, and his brother uh, Bobby Kennedy and his wife Ethel had bought a house as well. And the three houses all have kind of connecting yards. Um, when you think about a compound, I think you really think about these huge houses behind big gates, big fences, um, kind of all built together. These were just three separate houses that the family was able to purchase at three different times. Um, there's no big fence. There eventually was a fence built around the JFK house, but um, 
these are these are just three houses they were able to kind of purchase. Um, and that, that when when JFK was elected president, it started being called the Kennedy Compound. So this is uh, the the morning of the election. Um, I tell the story in the book of the uh, of the the night that he was elected. And I'll read a little piece of that now. <clears throat> and this was the only picture taken that day. It was kind of um, hectic to get everybody together. Okay, here we go. Um, so, so he, JFK was actually in Hyannis Port the, um, the night that they were waiting for the returns to come in. They had turned his brother Bobby's house into a kind of a command center, but this is, this is the big house where the kids were kind of sleeping and to get away from all of the hubbub of uh, the reporters and everything. That In the armory in downtown Hyannis is where all the reporters were. So the reporters were kind of making calls back and forth to these houses to see uh, to see how things were going there to, to, to add to their reports. The next morning as the sun rose, Bobby's house was quiet except for the sizzle of bacon coming from the kitchen. Ethel had woken up before seven to make everyone breakfast. Slowly as the smell of the grease wafted upstairs, people made their way down. Bobby and Teddy went to Marchant Avenue to throw the football back and forth for a while. On Irving Avenue, three-year-old Caroline and her nanny Maud Shaw were the first ones up. Caroline ate her cornflakes in her room as to not wake anyone. As Shaw noticed a man in a dark suit standing outside the window, he didn't look familiar. It dawned on, it dawned on her. He's Secret Service. Jack must have won. Caroline insisted on going to wake up her father then. When you wake him up, I want you to give him a nice surprise, Shaw told the little girl. Will you say good morning, Mr. President, this time? They went down the hall and knocked on Jack's door. They cracked open the door to find him sleeping. Good morning, Mr. President, Caroline said excitedly to her father. Well, now is that right, he said, looking over to Shaw in the doorway. Am I in, Miss Shaw? Of course you are, Mr. President, the nanny told him. So this is, um, after that morning he, at his own house, he ran over to the big house and they all got together for this one photo. Joe Kennedy had kind of um, notedly stayed out of all of the, cam the campaign as much as possible and um, he did not want to be in this photo and Jackie kind of pulled him in. So that's him there in the middle with, with Rose Kennedy. Let's see if this works. This video works sometimes, but not all the time. Um, yeah, so this is one of the White House videos you see. Um, all of all, all the neighbors I spoke to in Hyannis Port remember so vividly the sound of these helicopters coming on Friday afternoons. So when uh, JFK was in the White House, he would still come uh, to Hyannis Port on the weekends in the summer and would land here on the edge of the property um, with his brother and they would come and the, the, the cousins and the kids would all kind of run to greet him. And often neighborhood kids would come down as well to kind of wait at the end of the street and to kind of see this, uh, this incredible spectacle. Grab a glass, a quick sip of water while we watch. Yeah, and as someone knows, she is, that's when she was pregnant with uh, Patrick. <coughs> So yeah, these, uh, these were kind of, uh, as I said, I interviewed more than 100 neighbors and friends and staff and the, 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 the kind of the visual, the, the sound of, this, of these weekends, these Friday afternoons is kind of the most vivid. Um, the, the neighborhood had mixed, fe mixed feelings about the Kennedys. A lot of them were Republicans, didn't vote, for, didn't vote for JFK, but they were incredibly proud to have him as their neighbor. Um, and and these, these weekends were incredibly special. Oops, let's see if I pull this back up. Do, 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 do. Sorry for the quick. Um, another notable change in the neighborhood were these little white huts, huts that were put up all around the houses for Secret Service and for what they call in Highness Sport the summer cops because the um, population explodes in the summer anyway. Um, they have, they increased the police, pop, police force with these summer cops, many of whom I spoke to for the book. Um, and the summer cops and the Secret Service would kind of post in these little, these little huts around the properties and check for stickers for the neighbors to let them through. So this is Irving Avenue. Um, so the president's house is right behind there and Longwood Avenue, which is right kind of in the heart of Hyannis Port. And this is the Yachtsman Hotel. I heard wonderful stories about the Yachtsman Hotel. That's where, this is where most of the press stayed uh, during the White House years. Um, Pierre Salinger, who was uh, press secretary for the president, uh, would post up at the piano there and sing and kind of 
regale the, um, the press with uh, kind of enter entertainment the nights after these press conferences at the, at the big house. And um, I also spoke to Alan Alda, who, performed, who was actually very early in his career uh, in a comedy troupe, performed at the Yachtsman. He actually did JFK impressions with his comedy group. Um, he, he remembered it very, very well. He remembered kind of exactly what the Yachtsman Hotel looked like inside, and they would have somebody else um, pretending to be cruise chef, and they would kind of do these back and forth um, after, the, after the real press conferences there. So this is a kind of, that's um, uh, Bobby Kennedy, of course, with some of his kids in front of his house. So this is the house behind the big house. This is uh, the, they call, they call them, they still call them the RFK house, the JFK house, and the big house is what people still refer to them as. So um, they really tried to keep business and personal separate as much as they could, but when JFK became president, of course, that was unavoidable. It was unavoidable to bring business to, to Hyannisport. Um, the, because JFK's house is actually relatively small, he would have to, when he had meetings, this is a, ca a cabinet meeting, he would have to do them in his parents' house. So this is the living room of the big house. You kind of see Rose Kennedy's very floral decor with these very serious looking men in their suits. Uh, this is JFK Jr. He was another one I really, um, I spoke to a lot of his friends um, and cousins. I heard really incredible stories about how important Hyannisport was to him, particularly as a child. It was really a kind of a, a place to get away. There was so much attention to pay, paid to him his entire life, really starting a childhood, and this was a place where he could kind of get away from it. Um, he loved go going out on the water. He, as he got older, they had little sailboats called sunfish where he would go with his cousins and kind of try to flip them. And um, I heard a lot of really wonderful stories about his childhood there. This is Sandy Eiler. He was... Um, the family, the family athletic director is what they called him with JFK Jr. Um, they hired him to kind of, he was kind of like a one-man camp counselor. He would go from house to house waking the kids up, kind of dragging them out of bed. They'd have to wake, go into the sound, do, do swimming in the morning. They would have to go sailing. He would organize baseball games and football games on the lawn with the neighbor kids. So a lot of the neighbors I spoke to remember very vividly Sandy Eiler kind of bringing them into the fold to have enough people for these baseball games and football games. He was a big, big character. Um, and he later attended a lot of the weddings of, of the kids as they got, got older. He was a really important um, person to the family. Uh, this is a birthday party in the big house. <coughs> Excuse me, these, these vivid Kelly green walls are now white. So the house has changed a bit over the years, but this gives you a sense of what it looked like what it looked like then. Um, as I mentioned in, in my intro, the sailing is absolutely um, kind of critical to understanding the family. This is, they have these boats. I had took notes because I do not want to mess up the names of these boats. Um, the Wiano Seniors, and so this is the Victoria. This boat was bought for JFK when he was a teenager. He, he's the one who named it Victoria for About to Conquer. So the Wiano Seniors, which they make there on the Cape, um, they're 25 feet long. They have a white oak frame, cypress planks, and mahogany tiller. They're very special. You have to have one of these boats to compete in the races there, um, in the one design races. And so the family still continues to have Wiano Seniors. When I went sailing with Max Kennedy, we went on a senior. Um, and this big house behind them is the house that everybody thinks is the, the big Ken Kennedy compound house, the big house. It's not. This is their neighbor's house with these big, beautiful columns. This is the house Joe Kennedy thought about buying, but Rose Kennedy convinced him to buy the house they had rented because it had a bigger flat lawn for, um, for the kids to play sports on. But um, when, I, when I went look through social media, when I started working on this book, and you look for Kennedy Compound, uh, it's a lot of people with selfies with this house in the background, which is, which is not the white one, but right one, but understandably, I think this is what you think of when you think of you know, this kind of summer White House. This is Bradford's Hardware. Um, this is just a little, little hardware shop in town. It's still there. Um, but some of my favorite stories were told about Sergeant Shriver. I don't know if he was uh, Eunice Kennedy Shriver's husband. And he, um, it could be kind of difficult for in-laws of the family to kind of come into this big, competitive, you know, loud family. And, and it could be at times hard for Sergeant Shriver. Um, this is where he went to get away. He would, his kids and the, and the kids' friends said there was always something that needed fixing. It was the boat was broken, the dog crates were broken. There was always a reason he had to go get away, go to the hardware store. Also, the Sears down the road was one of his hangouts. And everyone who worked there knew his name. He knew their names. He knew the names of their kids. Um, and it was just kind of a human detail I felt like um, that, I, that I loved and was able to relate to. There's another 
um, one of the the <laughs> The um, JFK and Jackie actually, the last summer uh, of his presidency, rented a house on Squaw Island, which is a little island kind of at the edge of Highness Port, um, because it was the only place they could get privacy. So they, the first summer, they uh, they were at their own house. The second summer, they borrowed the house of their family friend um, um, Robert Downey, and then this third summer, they rented this house on Squaw Island, which the family fell so in love with. They so, fell so in love with it, they tried to buy it. Um, the family wouldn't sell. Um, they at one point tried to build their own replica of this house. They loved it so much. Um, but of course, tragedy struck that fall. Um, this family is now owned by uh, one of the members of the family. So I did several interviews in this house, which is just beautiful. It's on the water as well. The family had a lot of pets too. <laughs> Um, the Kennedys also brought a lot of celebrities with them to, to uh, the compound. This is Frank Sinatra and his girlfriend at the time, Mia Farrow. They, uh, this was after JFK, JFK's death. Uh, they came to kind of pay their respects to visit Joe Kennedy. They brought their big yacht and they parked it right behind the compound. And the neighbors remember so vividly this, this, the excitement of, of Frank Sinatra being there. And they kind of watched the family go out in their little rowboats to have grill steaks on this yacht. Um, it was... It was uh, quite a quite a weekend. Um, more celebrities. This takes us up to the 1980s. The 80s. Um, there were a lot. There were two very big weddings here in the 80s. One of them was Caroline Kennedy, and the bigger one actually was uh, Maria Shriver and Ar Arnold Schwarzenegger. It was an absolutely massive, massive affair. This is uh, Andy Warhol and his date Grace Jones. They arrived late to the wedding, and they made quite an entrance. Andy Warhol wrote in his diaries that he, it was a scene like he'd never seen in a church before. Um, this is again, this is uh, JFK Jr. Continue, really continued to go to the, this house after his father died, Jackie, continued to bring the family to the house for a number of years until she bought her own house in Martha's Vineyard, a much bigger, more private property. Um, but even after that, he continued to come. Um, the family was left, the house, excuse me, was left to him and his sister, but he was the one who used it the most. He, um, I was told great stories by his friends. He worked on a, on a um, scuba diving excursion trip one, one summer, and they went hurt, uh, hunting for pirate treasure. And there's a great story in the book that I will not spoil, but he absolutely got very close to finding real pirate treasure on that weekend. Um, but as I said earlier, this was a place where he was kind of really able to get away, get away from, th from things. <coughs> Excuse me? Squat, this house right here. This is uh, th this is on the beach. Um, I'm actually not sure which which house is behind him oh, here. He oh, his parent his parents' house. Excuse me. Yes, the parents' house that he bought. So they, after they bought that house and they kind of for the rest of the presidency went to Squaw Island for these two summers. They they kept ownership of their house. Yeah, they did. Thank you. Yes, it's a good question. Um, and this takes us up to today. This, the family continues to go there, and in fact, like, it's continued to grow, and more members of the family continue to go. Um, there are the three main houses. The big house is owned by the Edward M. Kennedy Institute, um, so it's mostly closed to the public, closed to the family. It's every once in a while, they will, they will hold events there. Um, Ethel Kennedy still lives in, in the house she's had for a number of decades. Her family still comes to visit her there. She has guest houses on the property. Yet, so I spent time interviewing members of the family there on, in her house. Um, the president's house is also owned by a member of the family. It's um, a private um, property there as well. And, and when it, Patrick Kennedy and his wife Amy Kennedy own a, um, what had been a garage and they converted it to a really lovely property. It had been the garage on the big house property. Um, so that Kennedy compound from the outside looks a lot like it always did. And the family still goes sailing on the Wiano seniors. This is on Thanksgiving, them piling all in. That's Max Kennedy in the yellow. He's the one who took me sailing. Um, and some of the other tr traditions remain, including uh, football on the lawn. This is Thanksgiving weekend a few years ago. Um, when the family's family shared this photo with me, and that's the house I mentioned. That's not the Kennedy compound. The McKelvey house is the one over there on the side. The, the this house is this photo is kind of taken from the point of view of the big house, so you can kind of see what they look out onto. The water Nantucket cells right behind there. And that's it. Yeah, I wanted to give plenty of time um, for questions and for people to share stories. As I've found, as I have gone around and done these talks, 
people have had such wonderful memories of the Kennedys themselves, and so I always want to leave plenty of time at the end for people to share stories or ask questions. So that's it. Who is Max Kennedy? Oh, good question. He's uh, one of uh, Bobby Kennedy's, uh, one of his many kids. He's on the younger, on the younger side. Yeah. Quiz, I can do it. So this is Ethel Kennedy. Um, this is Steve Smith. The, the, what's kind of fun about this uh, picture is most family pictures, you know, you kind of stand next to your partner. They're all kind of mixed up because it was kind of the chaos of the day. So it's Ethel Kennedy next to Steve Smith. Um, there's Eunice Kennedy Shriver kind of perched on the chair. This is Jean Kennedy Smith. So Jean Kennedy Smith's husband is Steve Smith. Um, it's Joe and Rose Kennedy, JFK in the middle, uh, Bobby Kennedy next to him, Jackie, of course, sitting down. Um, oh, did I miss these? I sometimes miss, mess up Jean Kennedy Smith. Yes, Shri so the Sergeant Shriver is here, uh, Joan Kennedy, Ted Kennedy, um, and Peter Lawford. Oh, and this is Pat Lawford, of course. So Pat, Pat's kind of next to Sergeant Shriver, and then Sergeant Shriver, Joan. Joan is the wife, was the wife of Ted Kennedy, and then Peter Lawford. And this is in um, kind of the living room, one of the, the living rooms of the big house. And uh, Jackie Kennedy kind of disappeared right before this to go for a walk on the beach because she was very overwhelmed, and they kind of brought her back in for this photo. Yes. It was, I saw, no, I did not, very sadly, because I did the book during COVID, so it was even more closed for COVID. So I did go into Patrick and Amy Kennedy's house, which is on the property, and I kind of walked around. I was able to see the property, um, but that big house re remained elusive. No. And the Bob, in Bobby Kennedy's house, Ethel still lives there, um, and the JFK house is owned by one of Ted Kennedy's kids, but the big house is empty, except for events. Family. It's owned... It, it's owned by the Edward and Kim M. Kennedy Institute, so the Institute owns it. Um, and the ins uh, Ted Kennedy's widow, Vicki Kennedy, is kind of involved with the Institute, but the family doesn't own the house anymore. It's owned by this Institute. So the Institute is a foundation? Yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of done in his name. And they, so the, the Rose Kennedy always wanted that house to be open for tours. She wanted it to be open for the public, but this house is, this, these houses are in the, at the end of a very residential street with no parking. The houses are pretty close together. It would be very hard to make it into a, any sort of like historic home that you would have, like the birthplace of JFK. It would be very hard to do something like that with it. So they have struggled what to do with deciding what to do with it over the years. And so it's kind of remained in limbo since Ted Kennedy's death. Um, but they're, they're trying to figure out the best way. No walking towards. They're hoping to do that actually. I've been told that they're hoping to do that. Um, and they do have events there for some of the family members, uh, relatives have held events there. It might be a hell of an income producer if they open that door. Yeah, I know. A lot of people would like to see it. It's true. Yeah, so Ted Kennedy um, had a house on Squaw Island with his wife Joan for a number of years. Um, and then when they got divorced, she ended up taking that house and he moved in with his mother, at Rose Kennedy, after Joe, after his father died. He, Ted lived with his mother in the big house. So in the book, I really talk about how he kind of becomes the patriarch and the, fa and the family kind of symbolically and also by moving into this house. And it really changed things. It had been very quiet for a while with Rose living there. And then he comes and it's, he kind of, he was single at the time. It kind of livened up the place. There were big parties. It was, it really changed when he moved in there. And he lived there until he, he died in the, in the house. Yes. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, it, it was hard at first and then became easy. It, it's a very private community, very understandably. So um, a lot of the neighbors decided like generations ago, we do not talk about our neighbors, you know, for good or for bad, we just don't talk about them. Um, I was able to talk to a, a few members of the family kind of early on, uh, Carrie Kennedy and Tim Shriver, the two first I talked to, and then they kind of would introduce me, okay, you have to talk to my cousin, you have to talk to my brother. And then I went out there for these two summers and I met a lot of people just from being there. So I'd be doing an interview kind of walking down the street and they would say, oh, you should meet my neighbor. Um, and then I would get emails, oh, I heard you're doing this, I'd love to talk to you. And so it kind of snowballed and suddenly I had kind of more than I could barely handle, but it, it, it took some time, it definitely took some time. A lot of these family, uh, families too, a lot of the people realized in some ways these were kind of, this is kind of a, a very specific angle and, and for some of them kind of a last chance to tell their story for people who knew the president. Um, we're getting up there in age, and um, it was really, it was incredible to hear their stories in person. 
So when Ted uh, married Vicki Kennedy, I was told that the, there was a kind of a makeover done on the house, a kind of a refresh. So those Kelly Green walls are white now. Um, they, uh, they kind of reupholstered some of the, the furniture. They made it kind of more modern and livable, um, particularly on the first floor. Um, a lot of kind of the kind of the main pieces, there's, they called the Pope's couch, which was the couch the Pope had sat in that they moved, they moved into that house remains there. Some of these kind of big important pieces remain there. And there's, um, so pe bits and pieces of it are. It's not exactly as you see in these photos, but um, there are kind of echoes of it. Oh, good question. I, I, I used to know exactly how many how, uh, bedrooms. It's like 11 or 12 bedrooms. The, um, on the first floor, there are two bedrooms that JFK's bedroom had been on the first floor and his brother, Joe Jr.'s bedroom had been on that floor. Upstairs, um, as you go upstairs, to one side of the stairwell is um, the family bedrooms and the other end is the kind of the staff quarters where people worked with them, where their bedrooms are. So it's something like 11 or 12 bedrooms. Um, and it's just those two floors, there's an attic that's mostly used for storage and then the basement, which has the movie theater. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, and some of them were very, very young and they kind of remember kind of, Rose Kennedy lived well into her hundreds too. So a lot of people did remember her. I also um, was able to use this incredible oral history project that was that Ted Kennedy kind of commissioned right before he died. He wanted to preserve the memories of the big house and of high, the family's history in Hyannisport. Um, it had never been made public. I actually, one of my sources is the one who was the journalist who did the interviews um, with, particularly with a lot of the neighbors who have since passed away. Um, and he mentioned this incredible, an incredible oral history project to me. And I was like, I, well, I've never heard of this. And I'd asked the library and they said, well, we don't know about it either. It turned out it had been kind of sitting in the corner of the library and nobody had archived it. No one had done anything with it. Um, it took me more than a year to get all the proper permissions for them to open it. And I got it like a month before the book was due. Um, one of the interviews was, was with Nancy Tenney, who was the neighbor I mentioned with that beautiful dress in that photo. She was, had lived in that, the house across from the family had lived there as long as they did. She moved there the same year they did. Um, she had passed away a couple of years before Ted Kennedy. Um, and she gave kind of all of her memories of growing up next to the Kennedys in this incredible oral history, oral history project. And I spoke to her daughter, um, who shared her memories as well, but so kind of I pieced it together with oral history projects and interviews and things like that. Oh, it's amazing. Yes, many, many. Um, oh, it was great. Babysitters, uh, a piano player, um, people who work security for the family, um, all, all sorts of people who work there. It really provide, for me, really provided an important perspective. I wanted to make sure that I was telling a full kind of 360 view of the family. They were, yeah, they mostly were, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they were really, they were great about it. I very much approached, I'm a journalist and I approached it very much as a journalist that I, you know, I said, I'm doing this project. I'd love if you would participate. And if you don't, that's okay. I'm still doing it. Um, and they, they were great. I was able to, as I said, about 12 members of the family. Um, and a lot of them, they did introductions to the neighbors. Some of the neighbors I, of course, met on my own. Um, so I kind of very much was, you know, it was going to be the project I wanted to do. So they did, there was, there were no permissions. They didn't see the book before it was done or anything like that, but they were really open. Um, I think it was this particular angle. I think they, a lot of them have become wary. There's so many books about the family. Um, but this particular angle, they were eager to participate with. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they absolutely did. Um, you know, I think for the most part, uh, it was kind it was, mostly fairly innocuous complaints. I mean, these, these are neighbors. So really it's like these, this, you know, this family member doesn't keep up their hedges. This, they, these fam they, there's so many kids in this family. So there was a lot of like, these kids pile onto the sailboats and they're reckless. And there's a, there's a lot of that. Um, there are also, you know, people just have opinions. It's the, it's the Kennedys, Every, everyone has an opinion. And so that a lot of the neighbors do too. So it's Chappaquiddick of course came up often. People had very strong opinions about that. Um, but for the, the general consensus, kind of if I zoom way out, it, the sense was we may, not dis we may not agree, they may drive me crazy sometimes, but these are my neighbors and they're important to me for that reason. Um, it, there's, it's very hard to find new information about the Kennedys for sure. There's, as I said, so, there's been so much written about them. Some, that some of the details I was really kind of eager to learn more about that I feel like are kind of brushed over in bigger histories of the family. Um, Rose Kennedy details and also Rosemary Kennedy, who's the daughter who had the lobotomy. Um, she had the, had the lobotomy when she was in her 20s and then kind of was gone for decades and then came back at the end of her life. After her father died, her mother brought her back to Hyannisport. 
and then the neighbors had incredible memories of her, as did her nephews, the Shriver men in particular, shared these very vivid, um, really incredible memories of her and talked about how much they, she inspired their careers. Um, and those stories were just stories I felt like I, I did, hadn't heard, I didn't know about. I, was, I, I loved hearing about them. Thank you.